Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to see that so many of you are joining us this afternoon, despite the fact that we're all pretty tired and full of new knowledge here by the end of this exciting Libra 2020 online conference. My name is Charlotte Wien, and I'm a professor of scholarly communication at the University Library of Southern Denmark. I'm also a great fan of Libra, and I've had the honor of chairing the Libra workgroup on innovative metrics for two years. It is therefore with great pleasure that I welcome you to this exciting session on data visualization and metrics. We have some house rule and you've probably heard all these rules many times, but I think I should just for good sake uh, repeat them. The session is being recorded uh, and we will share both the recordings and the slides afterwards. Also, if you have questions to the speakers uh, during their presentations, please type them in the attendee chat and then we'll do an, a Q&A session afterwards. We'll keep track of, uh, of your questions and we'll ask them to the presenters by the end. If you are facing any kind of technical issue, you should check your settings under the icon of the three dots as well as your internet connection. If you don't have any luck, Try to rejoin by closing your tab and reusing the link provided. So these were the house rules, uh, but much more important than house rules is content. And here over the, on the slide, you see that we have three presentations coming up this afternoon. The first one will be presented by Dr. Heather Piova. Its uh, title is Trust Through Data Forecasting the Fulfillment and Cost of Your Serials Collection. The second one will be presented by Britt Marie Wiedeberg and Anna Lundin from Sweden. And the title of it is Introducing Pay to Publish in Cost Distribution Models of the BIPSAM Consortium in Sweden, the Impact of Transformative Publisher Contracts on Cost Distribution to Consortia Participants. Finally, we have Building Trust After the Labour Action, a way forward for a nascent bibliometric services to be presented by Andrea Schreiker and Sherry Voker. So this is our agenda and we'll take the presentations one by one. It is a great honour now to introduce uh, Dr. Heather Piova, who is the co-founder of our research, the non-profit behind On Paywall and OnSub. Heather got her bachelor and master's degree at MIT, worked as a computer programmer for 10 years and went back to school for her PhD and has been an advocate of open science ever since. The paper will help libraries to, uh, to be equipped with better data to negotiate with publishers, communicate with the administrators and faculty and better understand their own serial collections, spend and fulfillment. Heather will discuss new metrics open data sets and open tools to achieve the goals set above. Well, Heather, take it away. Thank you very much. I have never been to Libra before in person. Um, I do wish we were in person. I am in Vancouver, Canada, and it's currently 4 a.m. So I uh, am glad to be here and glad to be sharing this with you. If I seem a little bit tired, uh, you know why. But the good thing is, this topic is the one that I am most excited about in the whole world. So I think that'll come through whatever time it is. Okay, um, so with no further ado, this is me. Um, and that's the other half of our nonprofit uh, called Our Research. His name is Jason Prem. If you see any of us at a conference uh, sometime in the future, please do come up and say hi. I work for, I'm a co-founder, one of two co-founders of a nonprofit, and everything we do is open source, open data, and open access. That's important to us and is really cool, but is not the coolest thing. Um, the coolest thing is actually the content of the tool that we've recently built. And so put on your seatbelts because uh, it's about to get really exciting. You might have heard of things that we've built already. So we are the people behind Unpaywall, which is an open legal um, index of open access. And it is powering a lot of tools that you use, even if you haven't heard of it itself. So the so Web of Science, Scopus, uh, Dimensions, and so on, all use Unpaywall to um, populate their open access links. So you might be using it already. Also, you might be using it in your library link resolver. And if you're not, I strongly recommend that you do. 
all major link resolver software includes an uh, ability right now to turn on using checking the open access database uh, so that if you don't have the requested paper in your subscription holdings, it checks to see if there's a free, legal, good quality version on the web and sends your patron there before landing them, them on your interlibrary loan page. That's free and easy to turn on, so I strongly recommend that you do that. Uh, you might also have one of the many open access um, extensions uh, on your desktop, or you might recommend those to your patrons or your alumni. Um, there's a number of them. Unpaywall um, actually data actually powers almost all of them, and we have our own extension for Chrome and Firefox uh, that I recommend you check out. The um, database itself is built by crawling a lot of institutional repositories, including probably yours. So you have an OAI PMH endpoint for your institutional repository. We grab all the papers that you've got in there and then see if there's full text versions, uh, what the licensing information is and so on, and combine that with information about um, gold, hybrid, and bronze and Crossref to create that database. We've Built, we've also done some research papers with all that. Um, and so you can check this out as, as they mentioned, the slides will be available. You can look for this a few years ago. Uh, we published this one in PeerJN just a few months ago, uh, this one on BioArchive. And we found some important things. So one is that right now, about half of all uses of the research literature are currently available open access. So that's pretty exciting. Right now, half the time someone wants to read a research paper in real life, measured uses, there is a free legal copy of it available. Furthermore, in five years, that's going to be 70%. So this, as you can see, is some kind of tipping point. Open access is important now in a way it never has been before. And that means we should do something with it, especially because if you turn this graph around, Half, only half of the uses right now require paying for, right? Only half of them do you actually have to subscribe um, in order to see. And in five years, that's going to be just 30% um, actually are, uh, need payment in order to view. And that means that the value of a journal subscription is collapsing. And that is why, of course, your subscription prices keep dropping. Now, if we were all in a room together, you would hear the person beside you laugh and the person on the other side of you laugh. So this is one of the downsides of doing this asynchronously. Um, but of course, they're not dropping, right? And so uh, we it's important that we make this moment when this much open access is available be a time when things can change and when they do change. So what I'm here to talk about with you in this visualization and metric session is bringing this data into a way where you can operationalize it to take advantage of the current situation in scholarly communication. And furthermore, you probably have to save money. So that was true in November when this tool launched, but it's even more true now, obviously. It's time to tighten our belts and figure out um, how we can save money. And obviously, the literature that's prepaid, which is the value of open access, whether it's prepaid through um, APC funds or prepaid through Diamond OA and volunteer labor, um, it doesn't need to be paid for at the time of consumption. And so let's take advantage of that. Furthermore, let's help you cancel your big deal with confidence. So especially these days as we're looking to tighten budgets even more, there's a lot of money tied up in big deals. People have been afraid to cancel big deals quite reasonably because they don't know what they'll lose and they, and they don't necessarily know how much they'll need to spend to lose the least amount possible. And that's what we're here to help you um, do. So when... What what would it take to do things uh, to cancel with confidence right now? It will take um, understanding the cost effectiveness of various um, alternatives. And cost effectiveness has traditionally been measured by cost per use or CPU. And that's what we can suggest we continue doing. We just add in a few enhancements to that. So in addition to just usage, as measured by downloads and cost as measured by subscription dollars to evaluate the subscription value, we suggest adding some additional data. So um, the use there, there's 
some uses that are in some ways more important than other uses, right? And so we can imagine modeling those by looking at the citations made by your authors to things in a journal and how many times people in your institution have authored a paper in a journal. Those are different um, representations of the value of that journal on your campus. And so um, folding those into use um, helps to evaluate the, the value. And so that's an important component. In the cost area, the, the cost of a individual subscription is important, but so is the cost if you don't subscribe. So the cost of not subscribing to a journal isn't zero because you're still committed quite correctly <laughs> to get the um, people on your campus the um, the research that they need. And that's often then done with, through interlibrary loan and interlibrary loan isn't free. So we want to actually look at net cost of a subscription, which is the cost of a subscription minus the cost of an interlibrary loan um, request for all the requests you anticipate getting. So we're adding that to the calculations of your real subscription value. And finally, we don't want you to pay for free. We don't want you to pay for things that have already been paid for. And so measuring alternative access through um, open access papers, perpetual access you've already got, potentially sources like ResearchGate and so on, is an important way of measuring what is the actual subscription value to you today. So instead of just cost per use, we're looking at net cost per paid use is one way of looking at that. Okay, actually, so just to walk you through it, subscription cost minus ILL cost of things that aren't available for free um, and the use is measured in a lot of ways. One important um, aspect is that it's not just number of open access papers or percentage of open access papers today. What actually needs to be evaluated is, is the paper open access at the time your patron wants to view it? And how will that change over the next five years? And of course, that's complicated because many papers are available as green open access only after a year's embargo. And most people want to read papers within the first year. So there's some lovely curves, right, of what becomes available when and when do people want to read things. And there's lots of math behind that. And we're taking care of all of that. Similarly, your perpetual access. If, if you have perpetual access all the way until the time you cancel your big deal subscription, that perpetual access is really valuable that first day. But as the days go on, the perpetual access becomes less and less important because it doesn't include the recent papers anymore. And so there's a decay curve. And so we're, we're including that uh, math too, because it has to be at the time of use for this to be a valuable um, set of insights. Okay, so we're putting all that together to build a forecast model, um, projecting cost effectiveness for every journal for the next five years. This requires some data a little bit of data from you, and then we bring the rest. So it requires a counter file to understand the relative use of different journals on your campus. Um, and then if you'd like to customize the model some more, you can bring in your own um, negotiated journal prices and your perpetual access dates. And we bring to it the open access data um, from Unpaywall and citation and authorship information via Microsoft Academic Graph. Um, you might not be very familiar with that because they have not put a lot of emphasis into their UI, unlike Google Scholar. Instead, they make their corpus available to, for others to build on like us, uh, which is pretty exciting. Okay, with no further ado, let me give you a quick demo of Unsub. Um, everything I'm about to show you is available. You can go play around with it right now in a free demo um, online at unsub.org. So that's unsub.org. Okay, and here it is. Um, so what, what this is looking at is it's modeling um, what does it look like if you were to unsubscribe from your Elsevier big deal? Um, how many, what is the cost effectiveness of your journals? Now, let me see what slide I've got next. No. Okay. Apologies, because I don't have a live demo here. And so I'm going to just ask you to zoom in. This first bar right here, this, this second bar right here is showing you the usage. So 
in this, um, this is real data for a large US university, 35% of all accesses that this university is gonna do over the next five years are available open access. So that's pretty exciting. And that's for Elsevier for subscription journals. Another quarter we estimate is in their perpetual, um, in their perpetual access. The uses will, will be fulfilled um, from their perpetual access. Leaving, if we play around and make this number of things subscribed be zero, there's only 40% of the uses that are actually not um, instantly fulfilled by open access or perpetual access. And that costs them only about 10% of what their big deal was costing them. And then this number 201 is because we start to imagine subscribing to journals um, with the most cost effective journal first, the one with the lowest cost per use, and then just subscribing to journals, we can sort of pull this little slider up until we're modeling paying as much money as we can afford and we can see how much use how much instant use that gets us and then we can also calculate from there and it's embedded in the model what that what how to fulfill the remaining uses so of course the authors will often um, google for another paper if they can't get it they'll sometimes ask a colleague or um, ask their uh, ask the author. Sometimes they'll learn how to sci-hub. About one out of every 20 times uh, experience shows, they place an interlibrary loan request. And so um, we're, we're estimating that number of interlibrary loan requests, uh, multiplying it by the cost of an interlibrary loan request, and using that to estimate um, your ILL spend over the next five years. Um, so that's a visualization um, version. Oh, I didn't show you this. This graph right here is a histogram of cost per use. Um, and so with the uh, best deals uh, here on the left and the more expensive journals on the right. You can also dig into the gory details uh, and get this as a, as a table view. You can export it to Excel and so on. You can dig into the details um, on the rows and click in and see how we're calculating cost per use. And this whole tool is forecasting um, over the next five years on that next, on the um, on the uh, tab behind it, the timeline tab. Um, it shows some of that data uh, year by year as well. So I'm just really giving you a very quick overview of this tool. Um, I do encourage you to go play around with it. It's free for you to use uh, this demo version on the website. Um, and there's also a video um, guide that shows you a little bit um, in a little bit more detail there on the landing page. So one limitation is it's only in US dollars right now. Um, it's not in euros. So but our feature prioritization is driven by customer feedback. So send us email if you're interested. The more people are interested in having us um, add the features to make it customized um, for different prices, um, the, the sooner we'll do that. So please, please be loud and noisy. It's a new um, tool and we want to figure out what makes it most useful. So please don't be shy. Also, it's worth mentioning if you've already canceled your big deal, um, you can use this tool to inform your a la carte subscriptions to refine uh, the subset that you're already subscribing to. Okay, very quickly, what about the publish part of read and publish? This is particularly important um, for um, institutions in North America that have do not have very good infrastructure yet for monitoring how much their university spends on um, APCs, you a lot of people in Europe are participating in the Open APC project, which frankly has really good quality data, and um, I think in many ways supersedes what we've got here on the published part. Um, but I'll give you a, a quick look anyway, in case it is relevant for you. So part of the other part of unsell, so everything I just talked about was about subscription. This is about paying for open access out of your university, getting an estimate of how much you pay to Elsevier, for example, um, so that that can help inform your negotiations, either for a read and publish agreement or even just for a subscription agreement, but you wanna bring that into negotiation um, talk about double dipping and so on. So um, what we've got here is a row for every journal that where your authors might be publishing as either hybrid that's in a subscription journal or gold, which is in a fully open access journal that 
um, article processing charge, um, how many papers your authors are on the byline for in the last five years um, on average. And so the reason it's got decimal points there is it's an average of over the last five years. And then here, the next column is what percentage of the authorship list were they? And we're using that as an estimate for how much of the APC fee we should assign to your university. And I can go into that in more detail in the questions if you've got questions. Um, but the, the quick version is we take that number of sort of the, the, num the proportion of the authorship list times the number of papers, multiply that by the, um, by the fee per paper to get the approximate APC spend. Okay. Okay, did that one. Okay, so here there's the URL written out for you, unsub.org. Encourage you to go check it out to answer a few quick questions. Um, it caught it's it came out in November. It currently costs a thousand dollars US per year. Um, you can subscribe to it on the purchase page. There's a little purchase at the top. You can use your ape your um your credit card to subscribe or request an invoice. Um, we are a nonprofit. Our goal is to price this nice and low so that everybody can afford it. Um, so that's the that's the situation there. We do have, um, yeah, sorry, all it takes to get started is one counter file. That's it. It's really easy and then easy to maintain after that. Um, there's 300 libraries using it so far, about half of them individually, half of them through consortia. So you're uh, not one of the first. You're in a good um, crowd. Uh, you might have heard of the um, State University of New York. They were one of our first customers. They've got 60, that's six zero institutions um, as part of their collective. And they recently decided to walk away from their Elsevier big deal, which saves them $5 million a year, which is a really big deal. And they said that unpaywall, and in that case, they meant unsub, uh, changed the conversation for them. So it was a really big component of deciding what they wanted to do and having the confidence to do it. That's it, everybody. Unsub.org, check it out. And my email address, Strat, my email address isn't on here, but it's heather at ourresearch.org. Uh, we'd love to answer questions. Please get in touch. Thanks. Wow. Thank you, Heather, for a wonderful presentation. I'm pretty sure that there will be some traffic at your website for the coming <laughs> time. Thank you very much. Um, preparing for the next presentation. Um, the next presentation is um, introducing to pay to publish in cost distribution models in the BIPSAM contribution of Sweden, the impact of transformation, transformative publishing contracts on cost distribution to consortium participants. The paper will be presented by Anna Lundin, who is head of the division, um, division national coordination of libraries, National Library of Sweden. Anna works at the National Library of Sweden, uh, heading the Division for National uh, Coordination of Libraries. This division handles the National Library Consortia for the Universities and Research Institutes, BIPSAM, negotiating uh, e-resources with all major publishers. She is the Swedish representative in the European University Association's high-level group on big deals and a member of the Libre Program Committee and peer reviews for their journal Libre Quarterly. Brit Marie Wiedeberg um, is head of licensing uh, National Library of Sweden. Brit Marie Wiedeberg works at the National Library of Sweden, coordinating the licenses and open access team within the Division for National Coordination of Libraries. She negotiates e resources with all major publishers for universities, governmental organizations, and research institutes on behalf of the BIPSAM Consortium. She's an active working in the ESAC and OA 2020 initiative and is a member of the CCC Open Scholarly Communication Advisory Group. She's Sweden's representative in the Scope Governing Council. Uh, Anna and, um, and Britt Marie will present a paper where they explore how the steering committee of the National BIPSAM Consortium plan to take action on the results of the study conducted by the National Libraries in Sweden addressing future cost distribution scenarios and internal international co co comparison and the calculation of the financial impact of 
changing cost distribution model on the participants of the consortium. Well, the floor is your, Anna and Britt Marie, take it away. Thank you, Charlotte, for this nice and long introduction. And maybe we should apologize for this long uh, title. But anyway, let me start by saying that we are very happy to be here at the Lieber conference and uh, going to tell you more about our study that we have commissioned on cost distribution model. The agenda for today looks like this. We have four points. I will give you a short orientation in the Swedish OA landscape and then I will hand on to Britt Marie who will give you some facts about the BIBSAM consortium and the focus will of course be on the study of the cost distribution model. And, at the, and finally at the end we will give you uh, some further steps that we're planning to take. So uh, let me start with this short introduction to the Swedish OA landscape. And here's an image of the uh, key stakeholders in the Swedish open access landscape. At the top, you see the government offices of Sweden, the Ministry of Education and Research. And uh, they are there because to point out that there is a strong political support for open access in Sweden. Uh, in 2017, the National Library of Sweden received a government appropriation directive for coordinating open access to research publications in Sweden. Uh, this we got after having worked and advocated for open access since 2006. At the same time, uh, the Swedish Research Council received an appropriation directive for uh, the open access to research data. And we consult on a regular basis and we have joint action committees to handle all these very difficult questions and issues. Uh, but what's very important is also that in the Swedish research bill uh, from 2016, it was stated that all scientific publications resulting from research financed with public funds shall be published immediately open access and all stakeholders within the research system have a responsibility to work towards this goal. So this also means that the Swedish um, Higher Education Institute, represented by the Swedish Rector's Conference, uh, are a very important player. And they, together with the Swedish Research Na uh, Council and the Swedish National Library, have all signed the OA 2020 initiative for the necessary large-scale transformation to open access. And we also have three funders who have signed the Coalition S or who are part of Coalition S. So that gives us a firm ground to continue the work. What we have done from the National Library's point of view when we got this submission was to uh, initiate and uh, deliver five studies, including 16 recommendations for national solutions to these open access um, issues that we currently face. Uh, one study was particularly focusing on the funding for transition from a subscription to an open access publishing system. And within that study there was a recommendation to form a high level group for national consultation to redirect payment streams because the study suggested that it should be a shared responsibility between the funders and the higher education institutes. So this group has been formed and it consists of four vice chancellor and the four CIOs from the big research funder. Uh, this group's aim is to plan for the national cooperation between the funders and the universities and to redirect the payment stream. Easier said than done. We've had three meetings so far, started in October 2019, and at the end of 2020, we will evaluate it to further discuss the strategic decision making uh, possible and needed to move ahead. 
because another um, illustration that we made is to try to get this overview of the payment streams. So this is an attempt to illustrate how uh, this flows quite uncontrolled. There is no really transparent, uh, transparent overall picture of the total cost flowing from research to publishers. And this leads, of course, to a different uh, kind of flavor of open access. But one way to reach the target for immediate open access is that we need to redirect the payment streams or to rechannel them uh, to finance uh, the open access and not the license agreement only to read. So with this complex uh, picture in mind, I will hand over to Britt Marie, who will zoom in on the blue box here or the blue building, the Bibsum Consortium. Uh. Thank you, Anna, for that. <clears throat> yes, I will give you some facts about the BIPSAM consortium in order to set the scene so that you know what we are talking about. Uh, the consortium was formed in 1996 uh, and it's administrated by the National Library of Sweden. And the reason for starting the consortia back in the 90s was the shift from going from print to electronic journals and the need to negotiate together in order to get reasonable prices for the so-called big deals. And it started with a few university libraries coming together, but now today we have 84 participating active organizations taking part, both from the university sector, from we also have some government agencies and research institutes. We have a steering committee formed by seven representatives library directors and vice chancellors, and they are chaired by a vice chancellor. Uh, today we have 44 agreements for e-books, e-journals and databases, and we would regard 15 of these agreements to be transformative. And they cover around or approximately 100 e-resource packages, and the turnover is around 44.5 million euro. Before negotiating, starting to negotiate with the publishers, we have some preconditions that we would like to see, and that is immediate open access to everything that is published, and also with the CCBY license, we would like to keep the reading access to what we have used to read, and of course, it must be a sustainable price model. And if the publisher is not able to deliver what we would like to see, we have two options. We could either just negotiate for reading one more year, or we could cancel the agreement. And so far, we have tested both these options. Uh, this is a figure showing what we have achieved so far. So the figures are from 2019 and shows that we, and in 2019, we published almost 17,000 articles. And calculations shows that 76% of these articles were covered by, by one, by these agreements that we do have today. And as you can see, we have agreements with the big four, Elsevier, Wiley, Spring and Nature, and Taylor and Francis, all of them giving us open access publishing. Uh, as you can imagine, we have several price models, uh, and but they are all based on the what it, how it used to be in the subscription world, and the, the reason for having many different price models has always been that we would like to have fair and transparent pricing. We would like our goal is that every organization should feel that they've got the best price they could get. And in order to achieve this, we have uh, built models around different parameters, like the ones that the one we guess we don't like very much is the previous print subscription spend because that's a long time ago now. But we have also looked, we also look at number of FTEs, students, and or researchers, uh, or 
number of FDs in specific subject areas like chemistry, physics, law, and also uh, pri different price models for academics and another one for non-academics. And with these new transformative agreements coming up where we negotiated also publishing a publishing parameter, it's hard to use these parameters because some, in some sense you need to get in the parameter of publishing. And the problem we have in our consortium, and I think many others have as well, is that we have some research heavy organizations that publish a lot. And then we have others that are more focused on education and don't publish much. And then we have governmental organizations that know that they will probably never ever publish anything. And the price must then be fair and transparent for all these groups. So in 2019, uh, the National Library decided that it would be time to do a study to try to, to look at the future for cost distribution models. And uh, we wanted it to be someone from outside the consortia that made this study, someone that could look at, at, at it without any pre-conceptions at all. And uh, we asked Robert van der Foren from the, from the Netherlands to do the study. And I think many of you probably know about Robert and heard about him. He's, uh, he has worked a lot with open access. So this is an overview of the study. Uh, Robert started out with doing interviews with uh, library directors, e-resource resource managers, internal and also internal and external experts, both in Sweden and from other countries, in order to, to learn about, to, to, to get information, to get inspiration, and, and to know uh, what lessons could be learned. The data was also taken from, this, from seven different publishers and put into the database. And from that database, then, data could be retrieved that could be used to model different scenarios. So what did this, uh, these interviews say then? Well, what was obvious was that everyone wanted to have fair cost reallocation models and everyone wanted to pay a reasonable price for the same service. That is easier to say than to do, but that was the wish from everyone. There were also folks about co-funding, redirecting of, of money, money streams. Everyone was agreed on the fact that it is really important to change the reallocation system now. It cannot any longer be based on number of FDEs and historic spend. And there were, but of course there is a, a fear that this will cost a lot for some organizations that publish a lot. So there was also, I think, a common sense that said that a gradual introduction is important, that also consultation during this pro process, and that the participants are involved, and transparency again, of course, and also a need for standardization. And, and if possible, simpler models than the ones that we have today. And um, when looking at all these answers, uh, you can see that there are challenges, surely. And um, stability, on one hand, you would like to have stability. That's what we all want to have. We want to know what we are supposed to pay and for what we are paying. But we also want to see innovation and to, to get somewhere and to have get simpler models. We do want to have sustainability and maybe some co-funding. But at the same time, we do want to have change and leadership. And that's also a challenge. And what has turned out has turned out is that leadership is a really important issue in this 
if you want to change something, you need to have the leadership with you so that they can argue. So the study came up with three different scenarios. They are named A, B, and C. And scenario A is very much what we already have. In scenario A, you look at the current spend, you look at the number of FTEs, and you look at the number of publications. And then you divide the cost according to that. In scenario B, it's about the same, but instead of looking at current spend, you look at institutional funding. And in scenario C, it's a different model. You have an entrance fee that everyone needs to pay, and then you have paying for publications, and that would then only be for the ones that do publish something. And in the study, it's said to be 10% for for reading for en for the entrance fee and about 90% for publication. But of course, that could be something that you could play around with depending on the agreement and um, what it lo it looks like. It looks like. Um, when we looked at um, how to introduce the pay to publish models, we thought that, well, scenario A would be the most, the best one to use probably and have not have such a big impact. But it turned out to be model C that would be the one with less impact. But at the same time, you would arrive to as near as possible to a model where you pay for publishing. And as you can see in this figure, uh, the organizations within the Vipsan Consortium has been divided into three groups, universities, colleges, and non-academics. And they are all affected in different ways. So how could one deal with the impact of pay to publish? Because of course it's an impact if you leave the traditional way of, of re redistribute the money, it must have some effect. And if you look at the top left corner, that's a model where you don't do anything. You just compare it with a model where you pay for publishing. And you can see that the ones that publish a lot, they will also need to pay much, much more. In order to not make the jump so heavy, one could, as is described in the top right corner, have some gradual reallocation so that you don't do all this at one go. You, you wait a little bit. And um, in the left corner down, you have the impact if you put in some tiers. And there is also the possibility to do some really disturbing distribution that you have in the bottom right corner. And um, I understand that I need to speed up, so I will just very quickly tell you about the recommendations of the study. And the recommendation is that you should further investigate in the parameter entrance fee. You should apply gradual introduction and you should try to implement the new model at as many, for so many publishers as possible at the same time. And you would also need to involve research funders. And I think I will skip this last one and hand over to Anna. Thank you. So since the study was finalized, there's been two occasions for participating organizations to discuss, to discuss and voice their concerns and to address challenges they see. This has been an important feedback to the steering committee on how to proceed. So uh, what is the crystal ball then? How do we prepare for next phase? Uh, well, it's clear that the research funder 
uh, as already was um, pointed out in the study, uh, that there needs to be um, a shared responsibility and the redirection uh, of the revenue streams and an involvement of the funders. The cost reallocation model that Brit Marie has explained has been tested in one pilot when they covered when the funder covered half of the cost. But we will also continue to do that with. Um, uh, approximately uh, a dozen of the renewal for 2021 with medium-sized publishers. Uh, we will continue to further develop the infrastructure for administrations of APCs and to engage the research community in this to make sure that they know about these agreements available. Uh, beyond transformative agreement is another important thing because this is actually just during the transition to open access that we will have transformative agreements. We want to move away from paying subscription to pay as you publish. The transparency in pricing is, is very important and we need to have fewer transaction costs and that the cost should no longer occur between author and the editor or the journal. Uh, there needs to be more uh, incentives for open access publishing to change the merit system. We had one study that focused on that particularly. So the research assessment and allocation system also had to award open access and that is being done by, for example, signing the DORA declaration. And uh, some universities in Sweden have done that and a few of the funders as well. Um, we will uh, also now um, uh, talk more to our members on how to proceed and uh, the number of uh, read and publish agreement increases all as we speak and we even managed to sign an agreement with Elsevier which was one of the agreements that we had to cancel before we achieved the uh, proper open access parameter and of course plan S and the compliance to that is becoming maybe less controversial among publishers but we still need to engage in, discussion, in discussions with the researcher on how to apply that. Uh, so I think that uh, by sharing the insights from this study, uh, we hope that we have given you some useful experience gained so far, you know, on how to elaborate on these parameters. And we look forward to entering into dialogue with any interested library consortia and of course with other publishers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to you, Anna, and to you, Britt Marie, for yet another fantastic uh, presentation. We are approaching uh, the end, so to say, of the presentations. Uh, and I, in a minute, I will give the floor to Andrea and Sherry, who are in Canada. Andrea is a research service librarian and a member of the Research Service Digital Strategies Unit at the University of Manitoba Libraries. She holds a Master in Library and Information Science from the University of Western Ontario and currently enjoys the rank of Associate Librarian. She has held a number of positions within Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba Library since joining in 2002. Her present professional responsibilities include scholarly communication and research data management, and has she has previously published and presented on topics including bibliometrics and research impacts. With her, she has Sherry Vokey, who is head of the Neil John McLean Health Science Library and an associate librarian with the University of Manitoba. She holds a master's in library science and uh, from University of Western Ontario and received an MA from Queen's University. She held a number of positions with the health sciences at the University of Manitoba Libraries since joining in 2010 and maintains an active research interest in the area of assessment, bibliometrics and research impact. Sherry and Andrea will in their paper focus on the consideration for governance and appropriate use of performance metrics as an ongoing concern among the academic community. Andrea and Sherry will provide an instructive case study on the role of academic librarians evolving role in the responsible and ethical stewardship of metrics for librarians wishing to provide support services for bibliometrics and related performance metric based services. Well, that is going to be exciting to hear and please keep the questions coming. The floor is yours.
Thank you so much. And good morning, everybody out there. And thank you so much for um, attending our presentation. And I am just looking for how to advance the slide. <laughs> oh, there she is. Oh, great. Um, so as Charlotte mentioned, Andrea and I both uh, have backgrounds in the health sciences uh, area of librarianship and have largely grown up around, grown with our faculty as they have come to us with, uh, in, in, in early days actually, uh, for requests with uh, requests for assistance with what we now know to be bibliometrics services. So this is something that Andrea and I, even though she has moved on in her role, um, is something that we've been dealing with um, informally and now more formally over a number of years. The research question that we have today that's on the screen right now, however, is informed to a great extent by the labor action that took place at our university in 2016. The University of Manitoba Faculty Association, which is comprised of teaching faculty, librarians, and instructors, went on legal strike for just over three weeks in October and November of that year. And more than ever before, librarians were finding themselves in need of greater clarity and definition around the library's role in this very hot topic on our campus. When it comes to the provision of library-based bibliometric services, what has placed us at the University of Manitoba in this very unique position and shaped our trajectory post-strike is the extent to which the applicability and use of performance-based metrics in scholarly work and evaluation were placed under the microscope in full view of not only our colleagues, union members, but also other universities around the world that were watching quite carefully what was happening with our situation for their own purposes, as well as our local government and the public at large. Oh, there we go. Sorry, there's just a tiny delay. The mandate of the strike, if you will, zeroed in on three main issues, workload governance, but the one that we're interested in here today is performance metrics, which I don't think we had anticipated at the outset, but really came to take on, it sort of to take over the strike and what people were talking about. Um, and this was performance metrics uh, contextualized in promotion, research, and tenure, and basically evaluation of scholarly activity. And while many U of M librarians were acutely aware already of the many pitfalls of performance-based metrics, we really came to learn that not all faculty uh, members were, namely our colleagues that were teaching faculty and even some administrators. And in that way, the strike served to, even out on the picket lines, really solidify a common understanding amongst librarians and the professoriate about how very flawed metrics can be and even detrimental if misused or abused. For many faculty members, this was the first time that they were learning that some of the common metrics, like the H factor, which is at least here, probably the nearest and dearest to our faculty colleagues' hearts, had fatal flaws that could both over and underrepresent their scholarly contributions. So now, as the University of Manitoba Libraries looks to further refine its bibliometric service offerings, in part through the creation of a new unit called Research Services and Digital Strategies, to which my co-speaker Andrea now belongs. The issues raised during that intense period of scrutiny calls for responsible and ethical stewardship practices by librarians. As such, we will outline the route we've explored in the post-strike environment in the absence of centralized or institutional guidelines. The strike ended without ratified language on performance metrics. At the request of university administration and our faculty union, the Joint Committee on Metrics was struck in order to try and reach consensus on some fundamental issues around the use of metrics in promotion and tenure or evaluation generally. Um, this uh, link to the, our report is hyperlinked, so I think once uh, things are up, uh, in the repository. If you want to access it, you can click on it and get to it that way. 
The university and faculty association each appointed three members to the committee. And though all six members agreed on the principles and guidelines contained within, and after nearly a year and a half of work, uh, I was one of the um, three people appointed by the union to work on this. The motion to pass it was defeated. That was, a, I have to say, a pretty sad day. <laughs> we were essentially back to square one in terms of having an agreed upon institutional policy or statement. Oh, thank you for posting the link. That's very helpful. The report is very much grounded in applicability to teaching faculty and to a far lesser degree faculty librarians who field requests for metrics based requests. Of the nine principles, the three that I've highlighted here in red have some resemblance or sorry, some relevance to library based services. But you know, we find it's, it's a bit of a stretch. These are very broad based. As librarians, we find ourselves again without a concrete statement on limitations to our services. Principles five, eight, and nine, though broad in applicability, have nevertheless served to informally address major difficulties when entertaining requests from faculty. And even though the report was not ratified, it provides librarians with the seeds for conversation and understanding in consultations with faculty members when they come seeking our services. But as with other statements and declarations that exist and that we all know about around limits and ethical use of metrics, these are not out of the box crosswalks that serve to inform library practice. So we still feel that we're a little adrift in um, how to conduct ourselves ethically in this, in this area. Just waiting for this slide to refresh, there we go. Um, so given the predicament that we find ourselves in at our institution, Andrea and I wanted to go further afield and take a look at what our Canadian or CARL libraries were doing. CARL stands for the Canadian Association of Research Libraries and represents 28 of Canada's largest university libraries. They're considered the, the large research intensive universities. And what we found is that unsurprisingly, most, or 23 to be exact, Canadian universities offer a bibliometrics or research impact type of service, with just 6% of Carl libraries having no visible public facing mention of a service of any kind on their site. It is important to note that the range and depth of services offered varies widely, so this is not a homogenous offering. We were also interested to know that those we were also interested to know, I'm sorry, how those 23 institutions were staffing their services. About 65% or 15 of those libraries have dedicated staffing or what Andrea will refer to momentarily as specialist level staffing. And this insight is not at all uh, representative of their level of training, experience or expertise. The remainder refer faculty in a distributed way to subject or liaison librarians. At our institution, this model is proving challenging for many reasons. Most importantly, we wanted to know which CARL institutions, if any, had declarations, statements, or stipulated limitations on research impact or bibliometrics services. Only few university libraries have posted statements or information about the responsible use of metrics and the library's role. We offer that while research impact service developments have taken off within the vast majority of CARL institutions, that far fewer of them have adopted an articulated position on limitations or how they will deliver a service that relies upon outputs that are fraught with a number of contentious issues. Given the literature review that has been undertaken in the course of this research, it is not surprising that we are seeing this hesitancy around a declaration. And with that, I will hand over the presentation to my colleague, Andrea Schweitzer. The researchers Lee Baker et al., Hammerfeld and Haddo, and May and Had Laddish have conducted their own research as well as reporting the many studies conducted at the institutional or national level where higher education are subject to a version of research excellence framework or some kind of um, metrics um, framework to determine quality of research. Across all of this research, they report similar findings of individual faculty perceptions, which is encapsulated in this, in this presentation. So um, the word time and again that is used is ambivalent. I would 
say it's actually closer to conflicted. And it's largely because um, as an individual, how you regard the metrics is on your own context. And sometimes they benefit you and sometimes they don't. And so that is why you have words like um, considerable, considerable ambivalence, skepticism or direct criticism, or if you are in, in a position like an established researcher, you regard the metrics as a sort of showcasing achievements. But largely the topic is uh, considered a touchy subject and uh, a lot of faculty express uh, mixed feelings. Both Hammerfeld and O'Connell et al. have um, contextualized the faculty perceptions in these many research in terms of um, two frameworks. One uh, for Hammerfeld is uh, looking at um, crowding out theory, and uh, O'Connell and in this presentation in this slide um, contextualizes the perceptions in terms of um, organizational justice. And organizational justice is uh, broken out into um, distributive justice and procedural justice. And in their research on that paper, they show that uh, the research excellence framework has been identified as being more located in terms of procedural justice. And procedural justice can be articulated into both informational justice, interactional justice. Um, so they do note that the individual responses have little influence as to the organizational response as the health higher education institutions are subject to multiple jurisdictions of measurement. Organizational justice theory reframes the concerns around research metrics into these components. And so whether it is a uh, so a positive perception of procedural justice, the institutional dashboard or research excellence framework is essentially equivalent to institutional practices from a collective sense of context, context sensitivity, process control with an emphasis on transparency and flexibility. And transparency comes up time and again. And in fact, even um, yesterday in, um, in observing the uh, Utrecht paper, uh, transparency again was noted as important in terms of getting a um, collective sense of, of um, team and, and um, um, development of a sort of organizational um, movement um, towards um, providing new services. So I will be picking up on that talk again shortly. So this is a very um, rich slide, and um, so I'll be attempting to break it down. So when bibliometric services are discussed in the information and library science literature, recent conversations inevitably move towards the librarian's role in navigating the complexity and sensitivity around research metrics. So as I said, terms such as transparency, advocacy, education, information provider, data stewardship are frequently invoked. However, the literature is conflicted as to what extent or approach the li librarian should take. So falling into the middle of this infographic is uh, Cox et al's uh, paper um, regarding competencies around research impact. Uh, and the role is informed in part by the degree to which the knowledge and skills of the librarian have in terms of providing the service. And so they break it out in terms of entry level, core level, and specialist level. And the specialist level having been, the, of course, the most qualified or empowered to take on strategic or direct advocacy. However, in their study, the qualitative findings identified that the level was least likely to be necessarily be identified as a librarian's role. Reasons for this are complex, but can be broadly categorized as contextual. And this is why I have this sort of two outward circles um, that would influence the two um, poles, I guess, of a librarian's uh, approach. And two contexts that I have not included here is the library's context and the national context. 
And I've noticed a lot of the discussions in Libra t um, throughout uh, this year's conference is often referring to what is the library's context? How is the organizational structure influencing how librarians actually conduct services such as the um, research impact service? So um, I'm going to talk today specifically about the discipline uh, specific evaluative norms of scholarly work and the institutional context, which can be multifaceted. When discussing discipline specific evaluative norms, Hammerfeld's work explicitly identifies and categorizes the norms in three disciplines spanning the discipline spectrum listed in this infographic, which can arguably to this point be tacitly understood as only the, those within the discipline. Being contextually sensitive or informed is essential. This is reinforced not only in Hammerfeld, but also in Lease, O'Connell et al., and Karsted's work. Lease felt that because librarians cannot bring the qualitative context to a given composition of metrics for a given request, the research, the, sorry, the service is limited or restricted in fully participating in the Leiden Manifesto. Karsted addresses these concerns by stating that any stewardship role needs to be very transparent regarding access and use. Quote, consider working more in depth with service declarations, both in terms of listing of services, but how they contribute to expectations, unquote. Moving to the institutional context, librarian's role will be influenced on whether the administration has taken a centrist approach to addressing the external evaluation demands, thereby formalizing the role within, of the librarian within that scenario. For some institutions, the librarian would naturally assume the strategic policy lead, while for others, the librarian would take an active participatory contributor as part of a team. Still others would have the librarian be an informative one only. Whatever the role that librarian takes, the emphasis on neutral transparency, encouraging or actively pursuing institutional conversations and of course an endorsement of the DORA principles providing clear service declarations and standard documentation that is consistent with those declarations. And I mean neutral, not insofar as not having an opinion, but making sure that they are open all the time to how their faculty is regarding um, metrics and how they're, it's impacting them. So, After the strike and before the joint committee report, um, I noticed that we received very few requests. I believe this was due because, uh, because uh, that everyone was waiting for the, the findings of the committee. I often heard um, comments made by the faculty such as, well, I don't need to know this because, well, the committee is going to solve this problem for me. <laughs> um, since the report and its nature, recommendations only and not binding on either side for commitments or further dialogue. There has been an increase in requests. In summary, the strike resulted in an increased awareness and research impact measures, but not a clear direction as Sherry indicated for the institution on how to go forward. To date, uh, our services have been conducted in a rather ad hoc manner responding to requests as an on as needed basis and loosely framed um, on a three tiered service as indicated by Lisa's uh, case report. Three tier being um, education as sort of a general um, approach similar to the competencies listed in, in Cox et al. Um, consultative and then um, we are moving towards the specialist or third tier which is report generating uh, complex uh, gathering of, um, of metrics. Reflecting on our research question regarding responsible and ethical stewardship of research metrics, the implementation of standards either at the libraries or institution level is a necessary element. This demands some form of centrism or oversight to ensure competencies are in place to adhere to the standards and the dissemination of templates that reflect those standards. For example, documentation and boilerplate language provided for every request, either at the consultation or mediated service level. The true conundrum that some or most 
librarians face is what to do in the absence of guidance. Is it just emphasizing responsible use good enough because the demand does not disappear? For authors such as Karsted and Webster, the answer is no. And so the call for ad advocacy to meet the need of collective conversation and guidance on how to educate research metrics at a given institution. Within our libraries, there will be a reorganization soon, more closely aligning liaisons to functional units such as the research services and digital strategies, which will lead bibliometric service delivery within the libraries. The university librarian is supportive in formalizing such a service, but is this support is based on interest expressed by the deans. It is not clear whether this in interest is an extension of university administration and or the Office of Research Services. And so um, how we go forward in terms of um, the first bullet point, um, how do we seek uh, collective endorsement of DORA is, is an open question for us. Uh, we're going to take the first step in um, presenting this presentation to uh, the UNFA executive and try and see a way forward to how do we seek engagement across the institution to hopefully get some kind of um, direction or, um, or um, um, Senate endorsement of, of uh, DORA. Um, probably in tandem with that is uh, developing a responsible use statement and making it available on our um, website and, and then um, discussing how to create and, and contextualize our services in terms of um, that responsible use statement. So making sure that the competencies across all the liaisons that are supporting the service are, are informed and are conducting their research um, services accordingly. So in our observations or our literature or review, we have noted that um, often the question is, is, well, should the librarians be involved in this? We would argue based on our review that it, the answer is not should, but how. So does responsible use statements affect, actively contribute to a positive change perception of procedural justice? How does librarian advocacy or active modeling responsible use statements and bibliometric service provision contribute to that perception? And what is the degree of influence? So is it just librarians alone in terms of how they're delivering metrics? Or is there other factors at play? I thank you very much for your attention and we welcome any questions you may have. And thank you so much to both of you. Yet another very, very interesting presentation. And it's so nice to have our Canadian colleagues with us uh, today. This is quite new in LIBO because we are normally mainly European. So it's very, very nice to have you here. Can I please ask the presenters to turn on their cameras so that you're all visible? Uh, a few of you, yes, yes. Very nice, thank you, and welcome back. Um, we don't have so many questions from the uh, attendees, but uh, there may come more questions as we go along with the discussion, and we have approximately 15 minutes left for discussion. And I think I'll start with, uh, with the questions we have in the chat. Uh, the first one is from Hannah-Laura van Haver-Becke, uh, who's asking um, Heather for clarification, the data in the UNSUB, are institution specific or global question mark? Yes, it's a good question. So in the free demo you look at, it is specific to one institution. It is real data uh, for that institution. Uh, we're just not naming it. And then um, if you buy a custom subscription, what that does is let you customize it to your institution. So you do that by uploading your counter file. And then if you want to, uh, your own customized price list and perpetual access. Now, if you don't upload your customized price list, we use the price list that's publicly available um, on the website. So from that perspective, um, it's global unless you choose to customize it. But the goal is that it is indeed institution specific. 
and the same attendee continues. Are all authors taken into account regardless of their author role? They are, yes. And one of the reasons for that is, unfortunately, so far, there is no standard way that author role is embedded in an article metadata at scale. And so some um, journals and publishers do that in their author contribution statements, but that is not yet reflected, for example, in um, Crossref metadata consistently. So I think there's work being done on that. So hopefully that will change, you know, in the in the long term future. But for right now, since that data is not um, readily available, we are treating every author the same. There are studies that um, have looked at if you look at just the first author or just the last author, um, does it make a difference in overall allocation of open access spend? And a little bit surprisingly, the answer is no. Um, at scale, it all if you average it all together, it all kind of comes out in the wash. Uh, obviously, for any given paper, it would make a difference. But in general, it's not as important as you might guess. Thank you so much. Uh, and we have a question, and I think it's for you, Anna. Uh, Jaina Rumler is asking, what about inclusion of care principles? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I was not aware of the care principles. So my uh, answer actually goes to the FAIR principles, because the FAIR principles, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, are the ones that we got also as a commission um, to uh, further investigate. So we got an assignment to propose criteria for evaluation of to what extent then scholarly publications in Sweden comply with the FAIR principles. So I posted the report in English, the translated report in English for that. But if anyone wants to add anything about the CARE principles or, or maybe the, uh, the one that was asking the question themselves, please feel free. Thank you. And um, we just received a, another question for Heather, actually. It's from uh, Judy God Godpas. She's asking um, the counter TRJ4 report has information about the years of publication of the articles downloaded. Would that be useful to forecast the use more specifically? It's a good question. And um, I think there's two answers to that. The first is that when Unsub launched, Counter 5 was not generally adopted yet. And um, obviously, Counter 5 is not just a different format, partly as the question is suggesting, it's also different data. And so we want to be careful in in using Counter 5 um, to calibrate it accurately to make sure we are, we're portraying that data accurately and giving good advice about what it actually means. And so right now we're actually um, just using Counter 4 and in the midst of transitioning to Counter 5 over the next month or two. So you're quite right that Counter um, includes um, information about the date of publication. Um, and, the, and because we are based on counter four, we've actually been getting that information in different ways. So um, so we're actually, it's, I think the right answer is we're in the midst of looking at that um, to figure out whether that's data that we can pull in or not. Um, one thing is that count, one of the big differences in counter five is it's treating open access differently. And we're actually, but we are not going to use that information because that does not include green open access, which is a really important component. And so that's why we're using the unpaywall data set for open access rather than what we can get out of counter. So that's an example of a case where counter is providing data, we can actually get sort of better quality, more extensive data elsewhere. So we're not using the counter data. That's worth it. Thank you. Good question. And uh, Clara Ginter is asking, I think she may be asking you, Britt Marie, uh, within BIPSAM, have you discussed the risk when transitioning to pay as you publish that the price increases we see with uh, journals with uh, will be transferred to APCs? Yes, <laughs> it's the short answer. Yes, of course. Yeah. It's a huge risk. But okay. I would also add maybe that what we have discussed a lot is, of course, that as a collective, we think that APCs 
could be more looked upon as paying for a service that uh, the publisher is providing for that particular journal instead of the journal prices, which are in some sense based on the impact factor of that journal or that publisher's impact for the big deal. So I think that with the transparency, we want to strive for pushing the prices uh, down on the APCs as a global community. Thank you. Um, there are no more questions in the attendee chat, but but I actually have a, a few questions. Heather wants to add something there. Oh, sorry. Right. Yeah, sure, and sure. actually, I'm sorry. It wasn't actually in response to what you were just saying. I just realized I there was an important part of the question I was answering that I forgot. <laughs> and that is just to highlight that we are actually using date of publication right now. So the question was, should you get do you should you be getting date of publication out of counter five and we're not sure yet but we are using date of publication really importantly right now we're just getting it from a different source so we're getting it um journal specific um download access curves so download over age curve so we do have those at a journal specific level um just not at a counter that's all thanks okay thank you so much um no more questions in the attendee chat, but I'll be most grateful if you if you present questions to our honored and very interesting speakers. I have a few myself, and uh, I would like to direct my first question to our Canadian friends from Manitoba University. Um, are there any movement towards standards shared by all Canadian universities at the moment, or are you sort of like isolated uh, islands uh, working on standards uh, all alone, or, or how does that work? Because in Europe we have um, stuff like the Leiden Manifesto and things that we sort of we haven't all signed up to them, but but they are there and they are standards that we sort of refer to. How does that work in Canada? Yeah, no, we. Um we aspire to sort of lie to manifesto uh, universities, uh, for example, the, the tri-agency um, uh, three plus, so that's the granting agency plus uh, two other uh, grant funders have uh, recently as of January, 2020, announced uh, their endorse uh, signatories now to DORA. So uh, there are, are growing number of Canadian institutions who are DORA signatories. However, unlike in Europe where there is, um, some of these things have been becoming as a result of, um, you know, national uh, or otherwise um, research excellent frameworks or something similar to that, there is no such um, incentivization that way. So we are doing it um, in good faith, I guess, but there's no sort of um, in response to, you know, some kind of um, global um, framework. And I must apologize for the sound of honking horns that you may be able to hear here. It's the last day of public schools in Denmark and all the kids are out in the street honking horns and they make a lot of noise. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really sorry about that. Um, That's beautiful. And also, I just wanted to take an opportunity to um, pull our presentations together because I've actually got something to say about um, all across Canada. So um, just in the last month, the um, Consortium for Canada, CRKN, um, has actually all bought a subscription to Unsub. So all 70 universities, um, including the University of Manitoba, who actually was an even earlier um, subscriber. And so that's not a standard, right, obviously, but it is, a, it is everyone deciding to take a similar approach. Now, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to do everything the same way, but it does mean, hey, let's look at this data, and then we can have a common... Um, framework on which we can talk about things together. And so I think that's a that's an interesting um, point. That's all. <laughs> Thank you so much. We actually do have another question. I'm not quite sure who's it, who it is directed for, but it's Dr. Ivan Stefanov who's asking why funding on data set dissemination and open science data remains low. Can any of you answer that? Well, it's directed for all of you, so you sh you can hopefully answer it. Right. 
I think I, I think that if I was to interpret the question correctly, I would say it was probably mostly directed at Heather, but I just from a metrics perspective um, and related to um, open science, um, um, pay to publish type of frameworks. That's a very interesting question that we've noticed in the literature is um, and how things are going is how do we link uh, research uh, behavior with uh, a pay to publish model? And that is going to be very interesting in terms of how it changes library budgets. And I and that was actually a question I had for our Swedish uh, <laughs> uh, presenters because that's how we sort of see things going. Yes, we can't really elaborate on the funding on data dissemination, uh, but I can assure you that there's been a lot of work at the Swedish libraries to kind of lift this question of funding, publishing, that it needs to be decisions taken on a vice chancellor level. And uh, in, in some way, both that the library budget should be enlarged to cover these transformative or pure open access agreements that we also sign, or to actually work together on how to do that. So it shouldn't be that this is for the libraries to handle and you do it with the budget you have. It has to be a vice chancellor decision. Yes, we will move forward with that. So, so that has been a big change for the libraries. We don't see open access as a library, uh, solely a library issue. It, it needs to be um, uh, rooted and funded by the university level and the research funders themselves. And in Sweden, it's the national or it's the research council that works on the open data. So uh, maybe we'll need to come back and report on how they are doing on that mission. Well, thank you so much. Um, I also have a question for you, Heather. Yeah. Um, because I was wondering, what has been the reaction from, from the publishers uh, when when they heard about ONSOP? Yeah, that's a great question. So mm -hmm. one of the um, early reactions from a medium-sized publisher when we first presented it was, okay, this is interesting because we actually have a fairly liberal green OA policy, someone from the publisher said, and this, what you're suggesting is the elephant in the room. People have said, oh, green open access, that doesn't affect subscription rates. And of course it does at some point, right? It would be silly for it not to. And so he's saying, I want to advocate within my company that this is a change that's going to happen. And you're calling it out and you're making it true. And now we can actually have those conversations. Um, and those conversations could go, of course, in the direction of having a less liberal green open access policy. Or they could say, OK, let's see which direction the whole world is going. As funders increasingly require open access, a publisher, I think, at this point would be pretty short sighted to say, I need to make a change. And that change is going to be to restrict open access. So one thing we know we're doing with Unsub is we're churning things up, right? <laughs> that's the, that's, and, and we need to turn things up budgets like it needs to be a time we're turning things up and we want to help people be equipped to make those risky decisions and then the question is what happens after that and we're sort of counting on the community <laughs> um to guide the publishers to make the decisions that are in the direction of what we want to be building as a society, right? And I think funders are doing a pretty good job so far as our institutions and so on, and as our researchers with saying we want that to be open. And so I think publishers are starting to see um, that on the wall and, and that's the hope. Well, on this optimistic note, uh, I think we uh, we should wind up this session. I want to thank the distinguished speakers. You've done an excellent job, and I think we had a very interesting discussion here. Uh, interesting topics all over and very, very nice presentations. Um, 351 people signed up for this session. I checked on the attendee list, and I saw that we were at least... Uh, 141 at a certain point. So thank you to all of you out there who took the time on this Friday afternoon to listen in and hopefully you learned as much as I did. 
Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your Libra conference. Bye.